it was plain as day to me that this is where I was going to die. I'm going to be killed by a guy that I was working with. So like this sense of betrayal, I could feel in that instant. And what they ended up doing was they just, they just switched our names up. So they were giving me his blood and they were giving him my blood. He was fine. Meanwhile, I'm getting his toxic bullshit and it's just killing me. Nick Lavery stands as a beacon of resilience and valor, his story transcending mere military might to embody the human spirit's triumph over adversity. In 2013, during a deployment in Afghanistan, Nick and his detachment suffered an insider attack, resulting in the loss of his leg. Defying all odds, he became the first special forces above the knee amputee to return to active combat, a testament to his indomitable will. His distinguished service is honored with numerous awards, including the Silver Star, three Purple Hearts, two Bronze Stars, a Bronze Star with V for Valor, and the Special Operations Command Excalibur Award, among others, marking his extraordinary bravery and commitment. It's one thing to say, hey, you need to be responsible, or you need to take accountability, or you need to work harder. But what's increasingly more powerful is them seeing the way you live. It's like persuasion versus inspiration. Life isn't a competition. I hear that quite often. I, I disagree with that. I think, I think that's a bullshit statement. What, what's your biggest regret? The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning edtech company serving over a million students nationwide. We understand that as parents, you want to ensure that your child receives the best education possible. Say hello to Argo Prep. With over 15 plus educational awards earned in just the past year, Argo Prep's platform offers your child video lessons, quizzes, drills, printable worksheets, and more. Best of all, your Argo Prep subscription comes included with four comprehensive digital workbooks that cover all four subjects, math, ELA, science, and social studies. Visit argoprep.com today and start your free trial. Nick, welcome to the show. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks to have for you having on. me, guys. That was a phenomenal intro, man. I may need to hijack some of that and <laughs> use that myself, man. Well done. Thank you. So I want to start briefly about, and you know, we don't have to get too much in detail, but I'd love to learn more about, you know, the the early you, the earlier years. What really motivated you to go ahead and serve? Well, my desire to serve in the military, I think kind of it began as a as a really really young kid although i didn't see it as the military until i really got into high school but you know i began yearning to kind of fill this void i had and that was mostly a product of me moving quite a bit as a kid i was in a new school every year so i was the new kid every year bullied picked on this insecure scared kid and i really wanted to be respected. I wanted strength. And when I got into high school, you know, joining the military, I felt like could give me that, that what I was looking for. And the only thing that stopped that from happening was I started getting recruited to play football in college. So I ultimately went that route. I was a horrible academic and you know, I did the bare minimum. I really didn't enjoy class or reading or learning, but I was decent in athletics. So when I, when I got looked at to play ball, I, I went that route. And then my sophomore year of college, I had just turned 19, was 9-11. And, you know, that was really the reason, although there was a seed that had kind of been planted years earlier. Uh, when when that happened, it just, the, the anger and the rage that I felt was unlike anything I had really felt before, that I struggled to actually stay in school. Mm -hmm. I was going to drop out of college and just enlist into the military because I knew where we were going and I wanted to be part of that justice to be served. Mm -hmm. Ultimately I stayed in school. I grinded out the rest of my degree and then I began looking at options to enlist after Why that. Why did you move so much? Well, <laughs> Why did that? you move so much? Mostly my, my parents, they had me really young. 
uh, really young. So just two young kids really uh, just grinding and trying to make ends meet and kind of bouncing from job to job and, and doing what they needed to do to keep a mm. roof over my head and my youngest sister and keep food on the table. So, you know, foreclosed on a couple homes, evicted a couple times. So just, you know, struggling through that grind was really kind of the reason. And then in, in conjunction with just doing what it took in survival mode, both of them were also striving to find, you know, their purpose and like what they want to be as, as individuals and, you know, yearning to find that kind of ambition and just going back and forth. Uh, so that was really the reason why we, we bounced around quite a bit. This, this is where it comes from. Hmm. And how from, tall? We're never how, stopping and grind mm -hmm. from parents. Absolutely. That is true. And how tall were you in high school? Because you're 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 six five, right? Yeah, so six five, six six, give or take. Um, I actually got a little taller after I lost my leg, which is which is a weird, <laughs> which is a weird phenomenon. It's actually quite common. Um, you know, I'll just hit it real quick. You know, so most of us, almost all of us, uh, have different length extremities. It's not something that you would notice. It's very subtle, right? right? But it's there. So I noticed that after I lost my leg and then I got a prosthetic on, you can obviously adjust the height of a prosthetic. And the first time I got my height measured, I was standing closer to 6'6". Six, six, and I'm like, that's <laughs> odd. And the docs are like, yeah, we see this quite often because chances are you just lost your shorter wow. leg. So now that we can mm. like level you out perfectly even, okay. you're just standing like a little bit taller. <laughs> um, so I was tiny, wow. though, to answer your question. You know, I, I wrestled at, at 123, I think, my freshman year. So I was of high school. I was just this mm. – I was a peanut. And it really wasn't till right. – it was in between my my sophomore and junior year of high school and then from my junior to my senior year. So, mm. like, those two summers, so basically, like, 12, 14 months total, I shot up, like, over a foot. And it was just this crazy wow. growth spurt. And I was all like awkward and like gangly and like I couldn't control my body. And I yeah. had Osgoods, like my <laughs> joints were all like whacked because I got so tall so fast. So uh, I grew yeah. up mostly really small and really just fragile in nature. And then I shot way up. And then, you know, I spent the first two years of college with, you know, nutritionists and coaches and like learning mm. how to kind of just fill out my frame. Mm. Wow. I do want to get into your story now. I know in four of, and I'll just set uh, some uh, background context for our audience, for those who are listening in. So in four of the combat deployments, you were wounded three times in Afghanistan, first in the shoulder by a shrapnel from a rocket propelled grenade, then by a bullet in the face, in another incident by an Afghan police officer who opened fire on your crew with a machine gun, which uh, I think many, many people know that story. But, uh, you know, you, in a quote that I found in an article, you wrote, instinct kicked in and I hit the ground, you said. But when a young soldier froze, you put yourself between the gunman and the teenager and dragged him behind a truck. You were shot once in the left leg and four times in the right. You nearly bled to death in the two hours before you underwent surgery after you were picked up by a helicopter. Now, I will take a moment to reflect back to when you first learned about the ex the extent of your injuries. Can you walk us through what was going through your mind in those first few hours? Yeah, I can say, I mean, I, so I worked on myself medically uh, initially with a, with a series of tourniquets and an internal pressure dressing, which is, is as awful as it sounds, especially when you're doing it on yourself. So, I mean, I saw with my own eyes within you know, the 60 seconds or so of being hit, just how serious it was. My, my right leg was just chewed to shreds. So it, hmm. right there and then on the battlefield, while we're still in the midst of an ambush, it was plain as day to me that this is where I was going to die. And I had been through enough medical training and I had been exposed to enough combat at this point in my career that I knew my femoral artery was cut and I knew the likelihood of survivability with an injury like that without getting in front of a surgeon really fast. It's incredibly unlikely, even with hmm. things like tourniquets, you know, they save lives, but you know, they're not, they're not flawless. So right there and then right. it's like, this is where it ends. And I, I was, I was supremely confident of that. And that's an mm -hmm. interesting kind of emotional journey to go on, you know, and it all happens really, really fast. Like time slows way down when your adrenaline is dumping into your system that at that volume. But, you know, right. my first thought was this degree of frustration because out of all the gunfights and all the things I've been in up to that point in my career, it's like, I'm 
going to be killed by a guy that I was working with. So like this sense of betrayal, right. I could feel in that instant. Right. And that just like twisted the knife a little deeper. I mean, at this point I had mm. fully accepted the comeback with your shield or on it kind of mentality. Like I knew the potential consequences right. of my chosen profession. And I was totally cool with that. It's, it's just like, really, man, like from you, man, like we were just training yeah, like yesterday. That so that, that, that sucked. And then, and then it, it moved to more of this feeling of guilt about, you know, this mm. image of my mother being handed a folded flag at Arlington and just feeling bad about what they were about to experience. But then this kind of warm, almost blanket of, of relief kind of draped over me because even though I knew this wouldn't remove the pain that they would feel, I knew that they knew that I was exactly where I wanted to be doing exactly what I wanted to do alongside exactly the people I wanted to be with. So I knew that they knew that. So I felt like that may just take the edge off even just a little bit. And that kind of gave me a little bit right. of relief. And then after that, it was, it was kind of a feeling of content. It was like, you know what, man, this is frustrating. And my family is about to go through the worst day ever, but I, not only chose, but I worked really hard to be a warrior and, right. and that's how warriors go. They go in combat alongside their brothers and I'm okay with that. Wow. And, and you were, if, let me know if I got this incorrect, but you were apparently given six units of the wrong blood type. Is that true? And how, how in the world did that happen? Yeah. So eventually, uh, like an hour and a half later, we were able to start landing hel uh, medevac helicopters because there's an ongoing ambush. So like, this guy started shooting at us. He was killed within, I don't know, 10 seconds, but it was the initiation of a complex ambush. So we had our camp almost entirely mm -hmm. surrounded by about 25, 30 enemy fighters that all began um, their ambush on us. So it took like 90 plus minutes for the guys on the ground that were still upright to get that under control. So I guess that landing birds. So this that land helicopters, I'm on the first lift. We get sent out to an aid station. Well, one of my teammates who was in the bed next to me when we got there needed blood too. And what they ended up doing was they just they just switched our names up. So they were giving me his blood mm -hmm. and they were giving okay. him my blood. And it's a mistake, you know, it's and it can happen. It's, yeah. it's, the human dynamic exists and no one is immune to to stress management and being overwhelmed by events. And you know, so Fortunately for my teammate, he's AB positive blood type, which is the universal recipient. Okay. So he was fine. Meanwhile, I'm getting his toxic bullshit and it's just killing me. So, you know, human error, it happens. You know, sometimes I'm asked like, man, you know, do you have any kind of ill will towards those towards those docs? And the answer is like, couldn't be farther from right. no. And I've, I've, right. I've got a right. chance to speak at different panels with them and, and talk with the actual surgeons and the trauma docs that were there. It's like, these people are there trying to save the lives of, of what was six patients, me and five of my right. friends and, you know, mistakes yeah. happen. And you know what? I'm actually quite fortunate that it happened to me because obviously I was able to survive. I'm here talking to you guys, but because of that incident, right. they ended up updating a lot of their blood protocols downrange overseas mm -hmm. because of that. So you know, who's to say that if, if that hadn't happened to right. me and the same mistake was made to someone else who was unable to survive, well, that would be, you know, an unfortunate tragedy. So in a lot of ways, I'm grateful that it happened to me. You know, like, like, like there is a saying, mm. what, whatever happens, that happens, happens what? for, for better. So here, here you go. Now it's much better. Hey there, before we dive back into the episode, I wanted to stop for just a brief moment and express our heartfelt gratitude. Knowing that you've chosen to spend your time with us, to listen and engage with our content truly warms our hearts. Every story we share, every topic we discuss is made much more meaningful if you are here with us on this journey. If you found value in what you've heard so far and you're excited as we are about the episodes to come, we'd be so honored if you'd hit that subscribe button. It not only ensures you stay informed of all of our new content, but it also supports us in continuing to create and share. From all of us here, a sincere thank you. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the episode. You know, uh, listening to you, I think the challenges that you faced I mean, many of us will never understand. And I think, you know, thinking of new generation right now, 
I mean, I think they are not even mentally prepared and even physically prepared for such extreme situations. And uh, some might even say that they are not as tough or resilient. So when you were recovering and it felt like there was no light at the end of the tunnel, how did you talk yourself through those tough times to keep going? Well, for me, it, it began with having an extremely clear, defined vision of what it was I was working towards. That's, that was essential. And I, I w that was very easy for me to do because at this point, I, I knew my purpose in life was to be a soldier and a warrior. There, there was no other option for me. So as I'm in the hospital, it's like, okay, I'm going back to doing what I do because this is who, a huge part of who I am and this is what I do. So I was able to answer that question for myself very easily. I had no idea as to how, but that's, a, that's an entirely different question. You know, what versus how is different. So all roads proceeded to the how. And I mentioned this early and often because that vision and that level of clarity is the thing that I would rely on most of the time when things got really hot. You know, I knew that this thing that I needed to do, whether it was something as simple as just sitting upright in a hospital bed was connected in a series of other events that were to come, but it was connected directly to what I was trying to do and who I was trying to become. So that's what I relied on. And this is, this is learned behavior. And this it maybe this is certainly an extreme example of that, but I have the same conversation with when I talk to guys that are aspiring to be, you know, special forces operators or SEALs or Army Rangers or, or any elite military professional, you know, like, what do you recommend I do to prep? And there's, you can talk about running and push-ups and leadership training. And there's a lot of tactical things you need to be able to do, land navigation. They all matter. But usually when I kick off a conversation, I'm like, why do you want to become a Green Beret? And in my opinion, there's really no wrong answer. I just think that that answer needs to be very clear and defined and continuously refined because in the moments of struggle and you're going to experience a whole lot of pain and suffering, that's going to be your beacon to grab onto to get you past that stuff. You know, I want to, I want to, sorry, Annette, yeah, I want to also our audience to know when I was preparing for the interview, I saw the video where you sharing that in the hospital. I think Michelle Obama came to you and you said to her, please tell your husband, count on me. I'm going to be back. Is it true? Mm. Yeah, it's a really cool story. Uh, both my parents tell it better than I do because I was quite <laughs> intoxicated on a whole series of drugs and pain management meds and anesthesia. But yeah, I had been in the ICU, the intensive care unit at Walter Reed for just like a day or two. And you know, doctors are coming and going and everyone's like masked up and I have a tough time even figuring out who anybody is. But I did remember a whole bunch of people in black suits started coming in and it turns out they were Secret Service. I didn't know at the time. And then Michelle Obama walks in. And even when you're on that amount of ketamine, you are not mistaking who she is, right? She's very distinguishable. And there was this, this like warm glow around her. And she walked in bedside mm. to me and she started talking to me and I was like mumbling and stuttering, nothing coherent back to her. So she kind of diverted off of trying to talk to me and started talking to my parents. And she's just standing right next to me, you know, bedside. I do remember she was, you know, kind, loving, genuine, authentic. This is what kind of I was picking up from her. She's talking to my mother and I blurred out to her, hey, I, you know, I need you to do me a favor. And she was like, sh like stunned that I even said something coherent. So she kind of looks down at me and she gets really close. She leans in and I said, I, I need you to tell your husband that I'm still an asset. Uh, don't give up on me and I, I will be back. Those are the three things I said. And just this shock on her face, not only was I talking and she could understand me, but like, how is it that this is what you, you want to say to me right now? And she started crying. And then, you know, my mother starts crying. I'm pretty, I think the secret service agents were crying. It was like this emotional moment that was going on, but dude, I was just dead serious. And I had been in the military long enough to know that nothing is impossible. I don't care what the pol what policy exists. If you get the right person to put their name on a piece of paper, anything can happen. And I just saw this as an mm -hmm. opportunity to get a message to like the guy that could make anything happen in the military the commander in chief like if he wants it to happen it's going to happen i just saw it as an opportunity to get a message to the highest level of decision making authority 
But I do think that that story kind of paints a picture of where my mentality was, even at that stage when I'm still in critical condition, doctors are still trying to keep me alive. Right. For me, it was it was all about getting back to doing what I do. And I really couldn't see or hear anything other than no, I, I love how, how he was on drugs and mm -hmm. still saw an opportunity over there. And he took it right away. That <laughs> yeah, man, send it. That's, that's crazy. Right? Why not? Wow. What a, what a story. And going off of that, by the way, I, I, I really do like your so social media. I, I, I love the posts that you've been making with the, the black background and these motivational mm. quotes by you and in the, the sentences that I kind of, uh, uh, one of my favorite posts, uh, was when you wrote yesterday's work does not pay today's mm. rent. Can you, uh, like, can you explain that a little bit more to me? Cause I, that like hit me really, like, I, I love that, but just for other people, like I, I want, because I want to go into the next segment here, but yesterday's work does not pay today's rent. What does that mean? Yeah. I guess to summarize in one word, it's, it's consistency. And, and you know, I, I don't know of anyone that's reached any sort of success, regardless of how you define that or create any kind of progress without consistency. You know, you can be picture perfect as there was such a thing for a day or even a week. But if it all fades away after that, then the work you did and the small gains you made, and they're not going to compound. It's going to fizzle. You know, so you got to be in it for the long term. And if you remain basking in the sun of the work or successes or milestones from yesterday or last week or last year for too long, and you can get stagnant pretty quick. You can become you can become content with where you're at. And in my opinion, the second we stop striving and stretching and trying to grow and push ourselves, we may be surviving, but we're no longer living. You're just, you're just delaying the inevitable, which is, which is to come. So it's kind of the idea of remaining hungry and grinding for the next 1% growth, regardless mm -hmm. of what you did yesterday or last year, or 10 years ago. Really love that. I, I kind of want to talk about today's generation or actually I want to talk about a couple of things, but the first thing that I was thinking about, and it's been on the news and I've been reading articles about it, wanted to see if you had any thoughts about it. Um, military recruitment numbers are coming way down. People, we're, we're struggling to get people, the younger generation, the Gen Z's into the military or into any of these services. Do you have any thoughts around that? I mean, I know there's a couple of reasons why, but it's it's very interesting because I feel like we we no longer have a pride to be an American, right? Like my parents are super proud from where they were. I'm very proud to be an American. I, I'm a I'm a millennial, so I don't I think millennials are still in that category. But I feel like again, it's really unfair for me to speaking about a whole entire category of you know Gen Z population. But I feel like a lot of our younger generation are like Americans. So what, like? America doesn't provide me with health care. How come college isn't f free for us? I have the right to. America sucks. Again, I, I know it's a very controversial topic, but I kind of wanted to see if you have any thoughts about that in general. Yeah, man. I mean, a few things come to mind. Regarding the military specifically, you know, the 9-11 effect has come and gone. And that was the right. driving factor for over a decade as to why people were trying to put a military uniform on. Al-Qaeda became America's number one recruiting tool. They really didn't need to go out there and try to message or market or brand or any of the things to try to convince people to want to be in the service. Our adversary did that for us. That's come and gone. And we've, we saw the same exact effect with Pearl Harbor. And you can look back through time and there's this surge of patriotism by virtue of military service on the back end of a catastrophic event. That's come and gone. There are people wearing the uniform literally today that weren't alive when 9-11 happened. So, okay, that's come and gone. Second thing that comes to mind is, you know, it's easy for us as, as older people. You know, I'm 41. I'm not exactly a, you know, a senior citizen, but I'm getting up there a little bit in age. It's easy for us older generation to look at the younger generation and like that everyone's lazy and no one wants to work hard and these, these kids suck and get off my lawn and their rap music and like whatever, like grumpy old kind of cliche you want to use stereotypically. I think that we need to be looking in the mirror at least uh, occasionally saying, well, we're the ones that created all this technology. We're the ones that created all these mm -hmm. amazing advancements and all these resources 
that these lazy kids are taking advantage of every single day. We built it. We, we built the iPad. We built the internet. Like we, we're the ones that created it. And then these young people come into the world and we're the ones that are shoving it in their faces. You know, I'm guilty of it too. My oldest is six years old and he's on his iPad like mm. daily. And there are times that I'm like, put the iPad down. I'm like, well, I'm the one that bought it and I'm the one that gave it to him. So of course he wants to use it and he wants to take advantage of not just the enjoyment of it, but the efficiencies of it. And that's where really it's, I think that the right. conversation with resilience starts to come in because efficiency and resilience oftentimes are two opposing different things. Like you build resilience by being, having inefficient ways of doing things. Like I don't have a vehicle to drive to work, so I'm going to walk. Like that's going to build your physical and mental toughness because you don't have the efficiency of a vehicle, just as an example. So we created all this stuff. They're taking full advantage of it. It's just normal for them. So I think a degree of ownership is not only warranted, but necessary in order for us to kind of temper our expectations. There is that kind of cyclical cycle, like good times, like weak men, weak men, hard times, and kind of goes around in a circle. I would agree with that. History would agree with that as well, mm. you know, but it's, it's the nature of evolution. So we can complain about it all day long, which many do. Um, but it's also just the reality of, of where we are. We have to get much more creative with ways to incentivize young people to want to do whatever it is we think they should be doing. And if we're talking military service, well, guess what? These kids, they have a lot more options today than I did, even when I was a kid, which wasn't yeah. that long ago. I mean, they have options and they know about the options. When I was a kid growing up, it was you go to college, you take a manual labor position, you go to jail, you join the military. Like that was kind of it. Like those are your like four mm -hmm. options. Yeah. Now, I mean, you got 11 year olds that are monetizing Call of Duty. You got 12 year olds that are monetizing yeah. YouTube and they all know it. So it's like, how do you convince a 14 year old or 16 year old to want to put a 75 pound backpack on and walk through the woods when that is a completely and totally foreign concept to just about all of them? You can't blame them, right? It's easy to blame them. It's great to blame them. It's not me. It's you. You're the problem. It's like, nah, we built all this stuff. We've enabled them since the time that they were born. It's on us as leaders to get more creative, um, to innovate, and to find ways to inspire and lead and motivate um, and influence the young demographic to fill these voids that, that are necessary for any society to function. This, what a great response. Honestly, what a you, great you know, response. You know, this new, new generation, as you said, Everything is our fault, yes, but they are afraid of taking responsibility, even even for themselves. You know, it's much easier just to follow somebody's orders, either as parents or they go to the job, they follow orders, and that's it. But when it comes to responsibility, they just want to run away 180 degrees, you know, to the other way. So how, how, but, what are the solutions? But, how to teach them to be responsible? But Vlad, how wouldn't your parents, wouldn't, wouldn't your father say the same exact thing? Like, man, like our generation, you guys are weak. Like, it's like a history. <laughs> every new generation I feel like every generation that, yeah. has said that exact same, yeah. like whatever we're saying, hey, man, we think the this, this, you know, this younger generation is weak, blah, blah, blah. I feel like every so what, generation weaker? in history generation has said after that generation? exact same thing. My, I, don't, I don't, maybe physically, I don't know, but like in all other ways no i mean life is great if there's ever a time to live i think it's now right i mean like history has not been it, it has not been easy for humans right a lot of hard labor a lot of struggle famine poverty yeah, but i also look at, at, at yeah. all the at, at all the skis right now and i get a lot of advice from the uh from my trainer <laughs> which is we're just jealous <laughs> uh, <laughs> young kids. to develop the responsibility in kids they have to be in the team sport because in a team, you are responsible for each other. For example, when you play tennis, you're just responsible for yourself. When you play, let's say, basketball or football or something like this, you're responsible for each other. So what, in your opinion, are the ways besides sports or maybe something else to develop this responsibility? Yeah, I mean, first thing, you got hit a phenomenal point. I mean, I don't know how many times I heard, even when I was, I grew up in New England, in Massachusetts, you know, and I'd have to walk, I don't know, give or take, quarter mile or less to to get to the bus 
to then get given to school. That was kind of normal for me. And I can remember my father saying, you know, when I was your age, I had to walk to school uphill right. both ways, barefoot, you know, carrying a hot potato to keep me warm. That was also my lunch. And it's like, <laughs> man, I'm walking through snow to get to the bus stop a quarter mile down the street. But like, I'm a, I'm a pussy or I'm soft because of that. Like it's the bus. Like this is just the more efficient way to get to school than walking 14 miles. Like you're talking about. So like efficiency, again, it's on one end. And, you know, oftentimes that does breed, you could say weakness, but you could just, bre- you, it, we rel- we begin to rely more and more on the technological advances that we have. It's not a bad thing. It's, it's actually amazing. So, you know, from one side, there's, there's the same on the other side. And, you know, to answer your question, Vlad, or just to add to your point, you're talking about responsibility within young people. I mean, because it, that's where it starts. It starts when they're young. It's, it's, this is learned behavior. It's learned behavior. So us as parents or us as leaders or teachers or those that are influencing young people, it's one thing to say, hey, you need to be responsible or you need to take accountability or you need to work harder. But what's increasingly more powerful is them seeing the way you live. It's like persuasion versus inspiration. I can try to persuade all day and that's powerful. Persuasion is a form of communication. Persuasion comes by virtue of communication, right? I can try to convince you verbally that something is important and I want you to do it. And that may be for great reason and for moral purposes and all the things, but inspiration comes from seeing. So they see you are living what it is you are trying to get them to do That's quite, that's incredibly more powerful according to neurology and psychology. You're not, you're not going to argue this. So as a parent, again, or as a, as a, as a teacher or a guardian or whoever is around young people, they're monkey see monkey do. Are you, are you living what you're saying they need to be doing? Or are you just talking at them? And then you're back on your phone seven seconds later, scrolling through Instagram. Cause that, that shit ain't going to work, man. If you're trying to yell at a kid to get off the iPad and you're on your phone aimlessly scrolling, that is going to be the effect. Like, what, like, what, are you, what, what are we talking about? I'm watching you do it every single day. The same applies for work ethic and, you know, all these other character traits that we want to see more in, you know, the next generation, the current young generation, Gen X, Y, Z, whatever we're calling the young people today. I think ownership of that. It's a word I come back to quite often. It's a mantra in the way I live. It's a hard struggle. I'll tell you, and I'll close here. What's increasingly difficult, man, and again, my oldest is six. My youngest is two, both boys. It's like you want to give your kids a better life than what you had as a young person. I think that's the goal of most parents who care. And you work hard and you create stability and security and school districts and a safe home and all these things. And it takes an enormous amount of sacrifices and hard work to create that. Where and when, I don't know the answer to this. I'm, I'm, I'm learning on the fly, but where and when do you, do you deliberately expose your children in this case to that discomfort and to that adversity and let them navigate through it themselves? Because if you continue to go in and just remove the problem for them every single time, how can you expect mm-hmm. them to build up any sort of mental or physical toughness? It's not going to happen. You've been removing right. it from them. So as a, as now as a father, my wife and I, you know, we, we have means and we provide and we've got all these things. It's like, where do you draw the line? And I don't think this it's hot and fast. It's not black or white. It's going to move and you got to be assessing, but I think it's important for all of us that have any sort of influence on young people to have that, not in the quote back of your mind, but in the forefront of your mind, right? Like, where am I going to let this person fail and feel that struggle of getting it wrong? in the embarrassment or the physical pain or all, whatever the discomfort comes, however it comes, let them feel that. Because if you continue to rob that from them, that experience, those reps, then of course they're going to grow up soft and passive and wanting everything done for them and entitled and victimized and all these other things. It it, it starts and ends in my opinion with us. That's such a great point. Wow. That really hits hard because I, I I just had a newborn. This Congratulations. Vlad has two kids. Thank you so much. It's the best thing in the world. I, I I really mean it. But like my so like growing, I'm not going to tell my story here. I've, I've probably said it many times in the previous episodes, but it was hard for me as many, many of us also went through many difficulties. And whenever I look at my daughter, I'm like, man, I'm I'm going to give you everything. You're going to have the best X, Y and Z. And you're you know, but you're right. Like I'm already setting like I'm it's very bad. Like what my mentality. But like I know that. But like 
it's it that but the the point you just said you don't know the answer to it's like where do we draw the line between hey i'm not going to solve this problem for you hey you you know my daughter comes back to me and she said she's getting bullied maybe and vlad we we, we yeah. talked about this with dr Shafali, who said maybe you should let your child get bullied mm. i mean what are you going to do? You're going to go out and pull them out of the school and place them, and you're going to move to another city. Yeah, let let your child you know, be like bullied, put them but, in another school. but speak with I mean, them at home. It's ridiculous. And make their internal power more stronger. This is this is the yeah. I think the key to speak with kids how to solve the problem and make but them solve it for themselves. Not you go and solve everything. And I can tell you, man, but you guys is, are, this, this you guys be... are defining, you know, most of my childhood and my parents, even at a crazy young age. And my, my father was 20 when he had me, you know, I'm coming home. He's both of them grinding their asses off you know, working crazy. I was barely seeing each other just in and out and nonstop. You know, I'm coming home, beat up in tears, no friends, just like the world is coming to an end. And I don't know how they had this kind of foresight at the time, but they, they they did not put me in this bubble of protection. They they didn't remove me from the school like your example. They would, but they were there to support me and help me and give me guidance mm. and be that like safe comfort zone that I could go into to get some reprieve and get some education and get some guidance. But then I was getting pushed right back out into the world the next day, and it's that constant back and forth of get beat down, get built back up, get beat down, get built back up. It's like brainwashing 101. Like that is, if you were trying to brainwash and manipulate someone, that's the way you do it, right? You hammer them into the dirt, they feel terrible, and then you build them back up, right. show them a whole bunch of love, and you do it again and again and again and again. The, the human mind is conditioned amongst these same processes, whether it's for good or for evil is totally up to the person or the circumstance, but that was it. It was deliberate exposure to discomfort and consistent exposure to challenge and suffering and pain, but then having a team to help educate me and help me, but not remove it for me. And then you do that again and again. And I bring this up because for one, people look at me, you know, cover of my book or the cool guy pictures, Afghanistan with the guns and the beard and the Copenhagen and all this cool guy shit. And they're like, oh man, this dude must be this like superhero and just like have lived this like crazy, you know, hyper type a alpha lifestyle his whole life i'm like for one that is wildly inaccurate I, i'm explaining to you right now what my youth was like but what i do attest a lot of my success to and my ability to overcome is because my resilience is stuff i had begun training on inadvertently and nothing i wanted by the age of four so by the time i got to the age of 30 and got my legs shot off by a machine gun i had been through a whole lot of reps I had a whole lot of reps in failure and losing and discomfort, and it just equipped me to to deal with that and then, you know, continue to work to find a solution. You know, talking about failure and discomfort, there's a quote that you said on one of your speeches. You said, I have a greater emotional high of losing than winning. Mm. I hate or I hate losing more than winning. Could you take us to the heart of that feeling. What is it about losing that stirs such a strong emotion within you? Yeah, and you know, this isn't unique to me. I think when, when I when I share that or use that in a room, I, I get a lot of a lot of head nods, particularly if I'm in like more of a competitive type community or environment, law enforcement, first responders, athletes, most most recognize that. And they're like, yeah, I, I'm the same, you know, and as as competitors, you you train to win. And that's oftentimes your job. Your job is to win, whether you're a sales guy, professional football player, or a soldier. Your, your job is to go out there and win. And you will do that, and you'll do what it takes. It's the, the emphasis that's placed on a lot of us through the loss that drives people who win with consistency to push that much harder or to learn that much faster or to just take that discomfort of the loss and then ram that back into the system because it's in the loss, it's in the failure that most of the wisdom is located. So it's this kind of one-two punch of recognition that that failure will happen. Even though we're going into win, we're, we're going to swing and miss. Like we're going to lose at times. But that's how I'm going to get better. So I have a higher charge from losing. I'm more amped up from the loss emotionally. And then that fuels the extraction mm. of the wisdom from said loss and then you take that and ram it back in and you go again and again and again and 
you know, in, in today's world, only we can be bashing like these kids all day long, but you know, it's easy to say like, I'm in, I'm in comp life isn't a competition. I hear that quite often. I, I disagree with that. I think, I think that's a bullshit statement. I, I would argue that competition breeds results and odds are there is someone out there that wants exactly what you have and odds are they're working towards exactly what you have right now, whether it's your job or a skill that yeah. you have or a possession that you have. Someone out there is working to get what you have, but let's remove that for a second fine, let's get that off the table. At a minimum, boys, we are competing with ourselves. At a minimum, you're competing with the version of you of yesterday. And you're competing with the version of you of tomorrow if you remain stagnant. So competition is an aspect of life, period. And those that play to win, but get an emotional, a greater emotional high from the loss, although the discomfort goes up because of that, it, you can also learn how to weaponize that. And then that's how you create greater wins. So no participation awards. No, man, there's no, come on. No <laughs> participation no. trophies. Yeah, winners and losers. If you lose, you lost. Not, not own it. I agree figure out you. why. I and mean, you, you're learning from your losses much more than I from your winning. You, you're winning you, you win and that's it. And especially when you're just putting one goal in front of you, you achieve it, you won, that's it. You don't know what else to do. But when you lose, at least you know somebody is better there. You keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing yourself. Absolutely. Nick, any thoughts on AI? Have you been like following a little bit about, you know, that's, we've, we have now like an explosion of uh, like chat GPT and all of these new AI tools. Uh, are you excited for perhaps what this looks like for the military within a couple of years? I mean, I think we're going to see some amazing things come out, which ultimately will reduce in casualties, right? American casualties, which I think is fantastic. But I, 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 I kind of wondered if you had any thoughts about that or. Yeah, it's, it's scary, man. It's, uh, you know, I live in the world of. So you're of more national scared. Defense, you know, it, 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 it's scary. You start to peel back that onion and it starts to get scary really fast, you know, and we've all seen Terminator and it's like, is this about to become a thing? Are we going to hand over the keys, the cyber genetic organisms? And it's like, who's, who's running this now? Is it just a computer? I, you know, fantasy can easily become reality, but if you forget that for a second, part of what makes the United States as different as we are is when it comes to our strategy and more particularly our tactics, we play by an entirely different set of rules than all of our adversaries, all of them, whether it's a terrorist organization, ISIS, Al Qaeda, Al Shabaab, like these guys don't play by the same rules we do. Right? We've got Geneva conventions. We've got laws of armed conflict. We've got international law. We've got, mm -hmm. we intentionally tie our own hands behind our back because we believe in doing things the right way. And that places, places at a severe disadvantage on the battlefield. All right, whether you're shooting lasers at mm -hmm. each other, like mm -hmm. Star Wars, or you're shooting lead bullets. It puts us at a disadvantage. And this applies also to major state actors, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. They don't play by the same rules, but we do. So it makes it incredibly more difficult for us to compete, but we still compete and we mm -hmm. still win. And I think that that is what makes the United States as unique as we are. It still is a beacon of hope and compassion and morals and values. And it's easy to look out, especially in the social media world and think that dogs and cats are living together and mass hysteria and we're all going down the shit out. And it's like, okay, let's just like take a, take a step back for a second. That is a huge differentiator between us in terms of AI, you know, man, without some kind of, which is impossible without some kind of global governing body to prevent the use of that going in a very dangerous road very fast, that will happen. Like, so we can continue to hamstring ourselves when you're talking about tactics on the battlefield. Like we won't use landmines. This is an example. Like the United States military will not put landmines in because we've seen over history that that can slaughter non-combatants, women, children. This is a tactic we won't use. Well, the, what the damage a landmine can cause, how horrible it can be, is nothing compared to what AI could do. Nothing. So if we're going to continue right. to operate with morals and values in terms of artificial intelligence and what's capable and what's possible, which we haven't even begun to see what's possible, and we're playing by right. a different set of rules as we have over time, that game starts to change drastically very fast and the lethality starts to ramp up incredibly faster and it just gets scarier really fast. So 
it's an interesting time, man. But I, to your point, yeah, the use of AI and other tech and drone technology and all these things is going to become the way we conduct, you know, force on force, traditional firepower, combat, fire maneuver. Like this, the way that you and I look at revolutionary war tactics, where a group of people would meet on a field and stand in lines in front of each other and just shoot lead pellets. And like, no one thought to get behind a tree. Like, what are you guys doing? Why would you just be standing there eating musket rounds? Right. That is the same way that probably my grandkids are going to look at the way that me and my buddies conduct Mm -hmm. combat today. Like, you mean to tell me you and your idiot friends were strapping on a hundred pounds of gear and chasing people through the mountains, shooting lead pellets at each other? Like, why wouldn't you just flown a drone in there? Like you had them. Like, what were you guys thinking? It's going to be that ridiculous what we're doing now only the time horizon is just much more condensed because as we learned, it's a snowball. It gets bigger, faster, it moves. So it's an unknown front, man. And I'm just speaking from personal you know, opinion. It does get scary, I think, pretty quick. What an what insightful answer because I actually have not thought about I, – I, I didn't realize or give any thought that you, you are right that the United States – plays by a different set of rules. We have our hands tied behind our back. In fact, I just saw Biden pass some proposals for AI regulations or how they're going to play. We're going to play by a different set of rules, but you're right. Who's to say China or we want to name countries, but other countries, they're not going to go all out and say, hey, man, there's no rules here. We're going to develop whatever the hell we can. But are we going to be winning in this situation? Yeah, when you go down that hole, it becomes very scary very fast. Or is it vice versa to have all those rules? Because they are not playing by the playbook, and we are. Yeah, it's it's a new frontier, man. You know, and again, like using minds as an example is one thing, and it's it's pretty easy for us to say like, we're not going to do this and here's why, and here's what we're going to do instead. And we're going to be that much better at what we do. And we're going to overcome that we're working at this disadvantage. But I think when it comes to artificial intelligence, we're, we're all venturing into the unknown. So it's, it's no way to know. I know what the kill radius is of a grenade based on physics. I know what it is, this amount of propulsion with this type of fuse with this enough projectiles, like this is the radius, right? You're going to kill five meters in a circumference. Okay, cool. We have no idea what what AI is going to be capable of doing. So, you know, if we continue to operate in terms of the Department of Defense with placing values and morals at the forefront of the way we operate and intentionally knowing it's more difficult for us, but we're going to do it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, not something I disagree with. I just am suggesting that it may right. become a much slippier, slipper, slipperier, more mm. s- slope faster and we're venturing into a place that no one knows just how how dangerous it could get okay. i'll pass over the last question or uh, last two questions Nick, to Vlad. i would like you to bring you back for a moment and um, think about the time during your service when you were away from home and think of the sacrifices you've made for all of us uh can you share with us a particular memory that you hold on to a moment um, that when you think back to it, reminds you of what you were fighting for uh, at the personal cost it entailed. Perhaps some message you carried uh, with someone back from home or promise you made to yourself that kept you going when everything else seemed to fade away. Oof, that is a great question, man. I love when I'm caught off guard. That doesn't happen very often, so you guys should be proud of that. Um, I'll tell you, the first thing that comes to mind, you know, m- the first half of my career was done. Uh, I didn't have the family that I have now. Right. So wife and kids and, you know, when you're single and you're out there and, and this is all you do, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier to just go like full tilt in that direction and assume the consequences. And, and this is what I do and what I live for. Roger that. And then you introduce, you know, family into the equation and it changes, it changes things. Now the dynamic changes, uh, and my first deployment, as a father was in 2018, um, we went into Lebanon and my son was six months old when I left. Actually, both my wife and I, we both deployed at the same time, leaving our son home with my mother-in-law. So he's with grandma and my wife and I are both forward in two separate countries. That in itself is really difficult to do. 
I mean, leaving your newborn baby is hard. Leaving your newborn baby, knowing that mom is also gone too, difficult. Being away from your spite. So a lot of, a lot of challenges. But I noticed really, really quickly that, you know, the dynamic was just different. And like, how do I navigate through this? You know, I have such a, a greater obligation to come home now than I ever have before in my career. All right. It wasn't reckless. I didn't go over there. I don't, I don't want to die, but the ante had been upped. You know, when, when you have a child that you, you have a responsibility, a massive responsibility to. So man, how do I navigate through this? And it was difficult. What I kind of landed on was when you're conducting operations, you're a hundred percent dialed in on the operations. That's it. Uh, at least I may just be speaking for myself. I'm speaking for a lot of other guys as well. When you, when you get on the truck or you get on the helicopter and it's time to go to work, you're all in on work, right? You're not thinking about mom. You're not thinking about baby. You're not thinking about geopolitics. You're not thinking about, is my, does my truck need its oil change? Nothing. It's just all in hundred percent. Boom. Here's my job. Here's what I'm going to do. Next objective, next objective, next sector. Boom, 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 complete back to the house. So that's not a time where it can really affect me. It can't. Where it did affect me or where I leveraged the effect it had on me was during preparation and during training and our, our lead up, whether that was just a couple hours before we get on the, on the truck to roll out or, you know, a month or two before we even left the States to go somewhere. It's here's where I can weaponize my love of my family and what I'm going to take forward with me. It's these little details matter. They matter a lot. And I found myself thinking about my son and my wife and now two sons as I'd be just like zip tying chem lights together to put on my kit to get ready to go to work. Just these little minute details. I was thinking about them. I can't invest any bandwidth or thought into them when it's time to go to work, but I can leverage my love and compassion and level of responsibility I have for them now and just pay that much closer to the details because the details matter. I guess right now, right? I mean, well, after you had kids, it's much harder to surf when you didn't have, right? Before, before you, as you said, you was on your own. Yeah. It was easier. I'm here. I'm all in. But right now, I, I even can't imagine to leave my kids for a couple of weeks or a couple of days. And here you're saying that you're living and wife is also living. That's something crazy. I got asked an awesome question um, recently. It caught me off guard, maybe six months ago. And and the guy was like, listen, I know you love what you do. And, you know, I'm so grateful for your service. But you know, as a father, do you not feel you have an obligation to maybe do something professionally that's a little mm. less dangerous, you know, for them? And I was like, damn, that was, he wasn't attacking me. He was just posing a question. It was awesome. I said, man, that was, that's great. I don't know. But I'm going to, I know what I'm going to be thinking on and praying on tonight is what you just said, man, so thank you. And I did, I was taking notes and you know, I talked about it, journaled about it, all the things. And well, for one, from like, just a pure statistics perspective, the special operations community is a, is a more mature, older demographic than the conventional military. Most of which operators on teams have wives and kids. So if you were to just remove all fathers and husbands from the special operations teams, mm -hmm. you would not have Special SOCOM would cease to exist. So there's that. Okay. What I chose to rely on and way more uh, or place more emphasis on was, you know, my son is six. At the time of this conversation, he was probably, I don't know, closer to five. And he's a kid. He's, you know, taking it all in. But at some point, your kids are going to figure you out. At some point, your kids are going to be old enough to not just fully process the way you live as their father in this case but be able to look back to see the way that you did live. And at some point they're going to, they're going to know all that. So while yes, it is difficult and there are certainly inherent risks involved with what I do professionally. We just, we were just talking persuasion versus in inspiration. At some point I'm going to look this kid in the face. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell him, Hey man, you can be whoever you want to be in this world. You can do whatever you want to do in this world. It's entirely up to you. And I need to be prepared for the response from him to be, well, is that what you did? And be able to back that up, not just with talk, but with proof, that pr proof that he witnessed and he lived alongside me. So when I say to him, hey, kid, you can do whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. He already knows. You know what? That is true. And that is what this guy, his father, me, is telling me 
to be true. I saw it. I lived it. Uh, he's living by example and I felt that. So yeah, there's a risk involved in it, but I've determined what my passion is in life. I've determined what my purpose is in life and I'm willing to pursue that um, based on what I believe to be true and where my purpose is. And, uh, and he gets to be along that ride with me. It's going to take another decade or so before you can fully comprehend that. But that was what I gained from that kind of perspective that was thrown at me is are you, are you living what you're preaching? Because that's, what's going to create the effect. What's, what, what's your biggest regret? Wow. <sighs> Regret's an interesting word, man. And when I think of regret, I think of if I could go back in time, would I, would I change anything that I did? And if the answer to that is yes, then, then that's regret. Um, And through that lens, I don't have a whole lot of regrets um, because even though I've, I've made tactical decisions in combat that have created consequences for myself and my friends around me, um, I can go back and with a high degree of self-awareness and honesty, know where my head and my heart was at the time. And although I've made poor tactical decisions, it's like, you know, if I were to go back and do it differently, Could things have been worse? Would more of my friends died than what did? And this becomes this kind of cyclical, really nasty rabbit hole right. cycle that I've gone down many, many times. And it doesn't ever really end. Um, so it's tough to say I have any regrets. If you use the word regret the way I'm describing, none come to mind. I, I do have some things that I would like to have seen played out differently. You know, if I could go back, I would gladly sacrifice my other leg, both my arms, my life, if that meant that some of my friends could still be here today. Um, it's hard to say that because I've been given so many blessings. And if things had played out the way they really should have, according to modern medicine, these two young studs I have here as, as children would cease to exist. And just how, how terrible would that be? So I'll say the answer is no. Um, I put a caveat on that because I've made a whole lot of mistakes that I'm certainly not proud of going all the way back to me as a knucklehead, 20 something year old running around the streets of Boston. I made, a, I made a lot of mistakes, but it's tough for me to say I regret anything because I'm just so blessed with what I have today. Um, that the, the fear of going back and changing a single thing and this butterfly effect happening. And if that meant that what I have today doesn't exist, man, then, No, man, I wouldn't change anything. I love to. I love to end on this note. That, Nick, you're... you know, I love this answer when somebody is don't have any regrets because to have regret was the point of this. So what? You have a regret. So mm -hmm. what? You would you would change this, but you can't. So live with it. Love what you did, and just keep going. Right. Yes, sir. Well said. Nick, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. It's been wonderful. For our listeners, uh, you can check out Nick's book, Objective Secure, The Battle-Tested Guide to Goal Achievement. And Nick, I know you also have a website. Is that correct? Yeah, website is teammachine.com. Machine is spelled M-C-H-N. It's got links to the socials and merch and book, you know, whatever. Awesome. Well, Nick, thank you so much for your time. It, it, it's what a wonderful story. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you. It's Thanks for having pleasure. me on, guys. I appreciate it. Great, great stuff. Thank you for your time.